Hi, I'm Bill Arnhardt. And I'm Andy Adler. So we're going to talk about the SVD, the linearized EIT problem on the disk. And uh, it's very nice to be invited to this virtual meeting in, in Galway. We hope one day we'll be there in real life. So the singular value decomposition, it's a really handy thing for any linear inverse problem. It helps us understand the yield conditioning and it also helps us to characterize what's valid data. And it gives us a basis of images in order of how easy those components are to recover. So the, you know, as, as you get more error in your data, some of the components get harder to recover. So some inverse problems, we have an explicit expression for the singular value decomposition. And the Radon transform on the 2D disk is uh, an exemplary example. On the image side, we have Zernike disk functions. And on the data side, as long as you use the right angular function, angular coordinates, you get Fourier basis functions, essentially. So we'd like to do this for EIT. In fact, I wanted to do this since 1985 when Jennifer Scott at Oxford told me that the first thing to do in EIT is to calculate the SVD. Uh, so I eventually calculated this numerically and presented it at the EU workshop on EIT in Copenhagen in 1990 in a keynote talk called, What Can You See With EIT? Bill, wasn't that the one where you left your slides on the plane? Yeah, I left the slides on the plane for the first keynote talk and they came by taxi and I gave the talk later and then Jack Yossin, they cut me off because uh, I was speaking in the wrong slot. So maybe not everyone caught the, the, the um, SVD and we're gonna do it again here. But no one's managed to diagonalize it analytically yet. We've done it numerically. And here's the new information. It turns out the spectrum, in other words, the singular values are not discrete. They actually form a continuum. And the discrete part of the spectrum looks rather like Zernike disk functions. Um, the non-discrete part, that can cause us problems, and that's, uh, that's a little bit of um, a, a warning that that might cause difficulties in reconstruction. The Copenhagen EIT meeting had the best conference outing ever. Uh, so we went on the ship and had a lovely dinner. I think you might be able to see Jack Yosine there on the ship. Okay, so back to the Radon transform. If you take the Radon transform on the whole plane, it's just integrate along lines. The adjoint, that's the back projection operator, you integrate all the lines that go through a point. And so if you do forward and then back projection, you get something that's just a power, a negative power of the Laplacian operator. So it's a smoothing operator. So that's neat. And on the whole plane, if you put in um, an e to the i omega dot x, where omega is kind of wave vector, um, what comes out is the same e to the i omega x, just divided by one over the length of frequency. Um, so these, these act as eigenfunctions and these act as eigenvalues, but anything can be an eigenvalue as long as it's not negative. So all numbers are eigen, all positive numbers are eigenvalues. Um, so um, on the unit disk, there's a different story. Um, so the eigenfunctions, the, the right singular functions, are these Zernike disk polynomials indexed by two integer indices, n and k, and the singular values, or the squared singular values, the eigenvalues of this operator, are just basically one over n plus one, so they decay rather slowly, and uh, so it's, it's the mildly ill post problem. Um, so these Zernike disk functions are func uh, polynomials in, in R, and they're basically Fourier basis in theta, and they look like this. Um, so the n goes down and the k across, and they consist of a polynomial and then um, trig k theta. So they're used in optics um, to describe, for example, the design of lenses, and they get cutesy names uh, like astigmatism and defocus. So each of these functions, the early ones have a nice name. We need to look at the Hilbert transform. Uh, so the Hilbert transform is an operator where you convolve with one over x, but because that's singular, you had to take the principal value, but basically it's convolution with one over x on the whole real line and the Fourier transform in frequency land, it's just multiplying by the sine, in other words, plus or minus one of the frequency. So it has a simple diagonalization and the eigenvalues are just basic plus or minus i. 
If we restrict it though to an interval and you just compare with doing the transform on the whole plane versus a disk, then if we integrate between A and B, um, but we evaluate between two other points C and D, it turns out that if the intervals overlap, the spectrum is discrete. Whereas if they just abut onto each other, in other words, they share one point, we have a continuous spectrum and that's going to be important for us. Now let's do the EIT version. So we get the linearized EIT problem on a disk and we, we solve for the potential with, with conductivity one and it's R to the K causal sine K theta. The fresh air derivative, the sensitivity for that trig measurement is E to of R uh, times the dot product of the gradients of the potential. To get the normal operator, uh, we multiply by the adjoint, which means summing over the K and N indices. And that gives us a kernel function, a function of R theta, R dash, and theta dash, which if we apply it, integrate, it gives us, evaluates this, this operator, the normal operator. In the case where E is independent of theta, it has a nice form. It's a somewhat more complicated form with the thetas in as well. So um, it turns out that we can write that operator in terms of the Hilbert transform, but the Hilbert transform from naught one to one infinity because the second variable is actually one over R. So we expect the, the spectrum of N to have a continuous part. And that was based on just the um, circularly symmetric part. The continuous part of the spectrum means that the answer we get, the, 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 this, the eigenvalues of, of the matrix that we met as discrete approximation will depend on how we discretize the disk when we do it numerically. Andy, over to you. Here we see some pretty pictures. What they are is the singular functions. So we take the SVD of the Jacobian matrix of EIT on a unit disk and represent it as an image. And we get this nice structure that looks of the low order singular matri uh, matrices that singular vectors that look like Zernike polynomials. We also get a number of higher order mesh dependent. So on the right hand side of the screen, we see these mesh dependent shapes and those change as we make the discretization more fine. If we compare these to the Zernike polynomial images on the next slide, then we, so now we're showing the EIT ones in the center and the true Zernike ones on the left-hand side with the higher order, the, the one at the top cut off because we didn't have enough space on the screen. So let's take a look at the two images just below it, which in Zernike are, have a linear shape to them, but in the EIT images are pushed to the boundary. So they're squeezed and we see them as circular. We see the same effect as the one just underneath those two in the center. This one is circular, but an EIT has a much broader center circle than it has in the Zernike. So this reflects what we're calling a push to the boundary, where EIT takes the Zernike shapes and pulls it towards the boundary because EIT, of course, as we know, is much more sensitive to the boundary than it is to effects in the center. Bill. Okay, thanks, Andy. So some conclusions. So the right singular functions of linearized EIT are a bit like Zernike functions, but uh, we need to find their explicit form. There were some mesh dependent singular functions that concentrate near the boundary that we think reflect the non-discrete part of the spectrum. And if you do a regularized EIT solution, obviously that, in, that includes different singular function components. And so that solution is likely to depend on your, on your choice of grid or mesh that you use to discretize the conductivity. So there's a little bit of a caution there uh, that, that check that your results might depend on the mesh. Um, so we hope to give you more details in a forthcoming preprint and thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you in the questions.